Welcome to the Fitness Industry Success Show. Ideas, inspiration, and interviews to take your fitness business to the next level. Next level. With over 23 years of fitness industry experience and the founder of Lead Lion, an innovative fitness marketing agency, here's your host, Nick Parker. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Fitness Industry Success Show. Thank you for tuning in. We have an amazing guest with us today, the world-renowned Jared Sirocco. He is currently the COO at World Gym International. He resides at headquarters and is uh, in charge of overseeing, get this, 232 gyms across 17 countries and I believe six continents. He's also the founder of Health Club Doctor, which is an international full service consultancy for health clubs, help them turn around and scale their businesses, take them to the next level with over 26 years of fitness industry experience. We are in the presence of greatness and I'm so excited to get this show on the road because we're going to be learning so much today. Jared, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks, Nick. Really appreciate the, uh, the warm welcome and the kind words. I, I hope I live up to the expectations there. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Uh, your content is always fantastic. So appreciate before you. we get started, though, let's play a little game. You up for a game? Sure, always. Okay, cool. So okay. we're going to play a quick game called Two Truths and One Lie, and we're going to ask our viewers and our listeners to guess which one is the lie. So give us two things about you that are true and one lie in no particular order and see if our viewers and the people that know you best can guess. All right, um, no particular order, two truths, one lie. Um, I've taught water aerobics class. Uh, I was an all state high school hockey player and I'm actually a great swing dancer. Ooh, curveball. <laughs> okay, so we have, um, you're a swing dancer, a great swing dancer, hockey player, um, uh, all state, uh, all high state, school, all high star, school, yeah. all star hockey player. Mm -hmm. And then the first one was you taught water aerobics. Water aerobics. Yep. I'm a water okay. aerobics. Yeah. If I had to guess, I'm going to say, uh, what was the second one again? Uh, what did I say? The hockey player, I think, was second, right? Uh, what was the third one then? Uh, uh, swing dancing was the third one. Man, I'm going to say uh, swing dancing is the lie. No. Oh, dang. Are you serious? Yeah, That's I'm awesome. serious. You're a natural John Travolta, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, no, no, wait a minute. Now, that is different dancing, different dancing. Okay. There is actually a story behind the swing dancing. No, actually, am I supposed to tell you which is the lie? Yeah, right now? yeah. which one's okay. the lie? So the lie is that uh, I was an all-state or all-star high school hockey player. I'm a huge hockey fan. I do play, okay. uh, but I never played, um, you know, in, in high school for a team or, or anything like that. But hockey is a, a big passion of mine, a great sport of mine. Uh, actually, yeah. I have taught water aerobics and I am a pretty decent swing that I can hold my own. Uh, nice. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> old, old 20s music. Yeah. So if I see any of you at a, at, a, <laughs> at a show and that comes on and you ask me, I may just take you up on it because it's a lot of fun to actually watch people's reactions when I do it. So. Okay, well, I might have to challenge you if you end up going to Ursha this year. <laughs> oh, I'll be there. I'll, I'll, well, it's fun. I actually have a great story about how some of my colleagues at one point found out that I actually did swing dancing at an athletic business show at the House of Blues in Vegas. That's a great story. Ask me about it sometime. I will, for sure. We're, we're going to hang out at Ursha <laughs> on that one. <laughs> for sure. Awesome. All right, cool. Well, hey, let, let the viewers know. I know you have a lot of really important things to share today that are going to help everyone take their clubs to the next level and just kind of give them some real strong food for thought. But let's back up a little bit. How did you get into the fitness industry and what was your journey? Give me the, the short version of that long 25 year history there. Yeah, short version, a condensed version. Well, I said I, I liked hockey. I mean, I grew up playing sports and, and loved playing sports and, and did it for the fun of it and the fitness side of it. Um, and as I was in high school, I said, Hey man, I, I kind of want to do some, what do I want to do? I was, I was lifting weights and exercise and working out and thought maybe I want to go to physical therapy school or whatever. And the more I learned about that, I was like, ah, I'm not too sure. 
And the local tech school, when I was in high school, offered a program called Wellness and Fitness Technology. They built this couple million dollar wing. It had a giant pool, but a working gym, group exercise room and everything. And the class was a two-year program on how to be a trainer. Like the final exam was you had to take a, a personal training exam and uh, step aerobics at the time. It was a step, <laughs> step aerobics instructor, AAA, ISMA test as your final exam. You had to pass both of them. And uh, I was like, man, being a trainer, that, that's what I want to do. And so when I realized that here in the States, at least, you know, um, physical therapy was ruled a lot by insurance and you couldn't do certain things without a prescription. And I really decided that the training side and health and fitness was where I wanted to go. So in high school, I was into my career. Uh, by the time I got through my almost my senior year, it was like spring of my senior year in high school, I was already working as a fitness attendant in a gym, already started my career, and my friends had no idea what they were going to do. Wow, um, that's so, so rare. That never happens. <laughs> yeah, and, and and the funny thing was, I took the final exam just after one year. I took the, the trainer's test after one year of being in the program and, and aced it, and so I was able to work as a trainer while I was still going through my second year. Uh, to, to finish the program. So that just spearheaded by the time I was 18, I, I got into medical exercise and post rehab and I uh, was in the management by the time I was 19 on my own two small gyms by the time I was 23. I uh, got into consulting right around 2006, I think it was when I founded Health Club Doctor. Yep. Um, and, you know, fitness has taken me all over the world, a lot of great people, literally trained thousands of people at this point and helped hundreds of fitness pros and business owners make money in the, in, in the industry that I love. So it's the only thing I've done for yeah. 26 years and wow. it's been awesome. And now here you are, you're COO of World Gym International. Yeah, so pretty crazy. You got pretty your crazy. hands full. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I'm came into busy. that position in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, it's actually one year, I think uh, last week was my one year anniversary in the job. Oh, wow. So. Nice, nice. Well, listen, uh, let's pull some golden nuggets out of you here because you got there's so much experience. You know, you, you've worked with so many uh, health clubs in so many different capacities. You've, you've walked the walk yourself. And I'm under the presumption because uh, I've been in the industry, too, and I've seen things, but I know you have a lot to share. There's got to be an underlying theme or a current that that happens over and over again for the ones that are really successful, that do it right, that seem to thrive. What are some things that you have found over the years in your experience and in your consultancy that makes a successful health club or a gym or a fitness business? I mean, we, we, we could spend hours on that. Um, if I had to narrow it down, it really comes down to just a couple of things, right? They, they have great systems and processes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes people win by default. They, they have the right location. There's nobody else in that market, whatever. But over time, that squeeze is going to come and systems and processes are probably at the top of the list. The other thing is great people. You mm. got to have great people in your business and, and great people is a product of what I would think was another important one. Great culture, right? You as an owner, a manager, you're responsible for the culture in that business and creating great people. There's a lot of people say, oh, I can never find great employees. Well, if you have that problem, maybe it's not necessarily the employees. Maybe it's you as the employer. Maybe it's you don't have great training for them. Maybe you don't have a great culture inside your business where you can grow and groom and help these people be successful. So I look at systems and processes, people and culture as, as key ingredients to having a successful fitness business. And I mean, there's a lot of other things that can go into, in, in, into that. You could talk about marketing, you talk about branding, but at the core of it, you got to have those uh, those three things. Yeah, let me have you unpack something for me real quick because yeah, I'm yeah. coming from the agency world, and in the agency okay. world, we call what you said SOP, standard operating procedures, right? And it's really important. Restaurants have it. Every gym should have systems and processes. What are some of the key things that you think have to be a part of that? And when you say systems and processes, for someone maybe that's newer to the industry, newer in the gym business or the health club business, that that really it kind of might go over their head a little bit. What exactly does it mean to have systems and processes in your business? Let's keep it simple. Yeah. Does everybody answer the phone the same way? Does everybody give information the same way? Do they mm -hmm. handle complaints the same way? Um, there's a difference too between rules and systems. Let's make that clear. So your rule is a hardly defined line. Mm -hmm. You will never... X, Y, and Z. You, you know, don't do X, Y, and Z. Don't say X, Y, and Z. 
a system gives you an outline of how to accomplish something, but it gives you the flexibility of adding that personal touch to it. And that's the beauty of a system versus a rule. Right. And so do you have systems in place for, you know, member acquisition, you know, membership tours, cancellations, handling customer service complaints, selling personal training, systems can be put in place for all of those things. And when you have a great system, sometimes people can be plug and play. I, I mentioned earlier, right? Like, let's say you have a hard time getting employees. Like you have a great training system for people coming in. But if you have a great system, fitting people into that makes them really successful. There's a lot of great sports teams as much as, mm -hmm. you know, you may hate them. And I, and I use it that in, in a, in an endearing term in a way, I'll give you a good example of a system based organization, the new England Patriots, they've won how many Super Bowls? you could talk about yeah. coach and, and Tom Brady and who, but there were with the exception of a year or two, mm -hmm. they never really had a cast of amazing stars. What they had was, a great system that they were able to plug people into that fit that system. Right. And they executed it very well. They adapted it a little bit to the skill set of those players. Mm -hmm. They ran a playbook that was a system that each, each person knew what they had to do. And they were very successful at it for a very long time. So say what you want about whatever. <laughs> that was an example of, of a well-run system Mm -hmm. with people being interchanged in and out, regardless of, of what they were and their, and their status was. And they knew how to get the most out of those people. I look at that as much as I, as a Philadelphia Eagles fan, detest <laughs> <they're doing laughs> from a sports fan perspective, you have to respect, you know, an organization that can do that. And there's plenty of businesses that have the same type of thing. Uh, and, and you can see how that's carried out in the success yeah. of those the organizations. For sure. You know, and uh, one of the most recommended books is uh, Michael Gerber's uh, E-Myth. Um, and that's exactly what he talks about in the book for entrepreneurs is, you know, have, running a business like a franchise, right? So it's duplicatable. It's a repeatable process that you can do over and over to build consistency in your product, your service offering, your customer service, and how everything operates and that helps your business to scale, right? So yeah, I, I'm 100% with you with what you're talking about with uh, processes and systems. Yeah, and you're, you know, you're talking to a guy now in the franchise world, right? And people yep. go, oh, well, why should I franchise? And I, I think we'll talk about this in a little bit, but systems and processes. And the be beautiful thing about World Gym, what I really love about it is that we provide that, but we also provide what we call a flexible model, the ability to adapt it to your market, take our mm -hmm. systems and processes and make it work for you in your marketplace. And, and we see great, great results from, from yeah, that exact awesome. same playbook. Plug and play, making life easy, right? Yep. So taking exactly. the guesswork out of it. Yep. Um, so let me flip that question on its head. So sure. you said that the, the two or three primary drivers is the uh, systems and processes, uh, people, are key and we we know how important people are and then having the right culture what are some of the things that you've seen repeated over and over again that consistently have caused clubs to fail gyms or fitness businesses to fail on a regular basis well let's take one of the ones that were successful having a very poor culture mm -hmm. is like poison right you know and and there's nothing that deteriorates a business quicker than poor culture. You can make some bad business decisions, right? Right. But man, when, when, when the environment for the employees isn't good, forget it. And, and you look at, um, I think it was Richard Branson, right? So Richard Branson, Virgin, Virgin Athletic mm -hmm. Clubs and all that. Yeah. And one of the statements he always said was, always make sure you take care of the people who take care of your customers. Yes. Right, because at the end of the day, that's really what it's about. I want to make sure I've got happy, healthy, great frontline employees. When they're happy, when they're engaged, when there's buy-in, when, when they are part of something, it shows in the way that they talk to your customers and handle things. But if they, you know, they're dragging their miserable butts to the gym and they're, 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 it's going to come out in mm -hmm. the way that they handle things. And we're in a people business, so you can't have that. So poor culture, well, mm -hmm. I would say, Failure to evolve is another one, right? I mean, let's take away not having good systems and processes and that type of thing, but failure to evolve. Some people get stuck in what I call the monkey and the crocodile syndrome. They, they do the same thing over and over again. 
Right. And so I don't know if you're familiar with that story, but so real Tell quick, the story. Tell the yeah, story. Yeah, sure, real quick. So so you got the, the story of a monkey and a crocodile. So here it is one day, a really hot, steamy summer day. And, you know, this crocodile is kind of half in the water and he's laying in the mud with his mouth open and just getting sun like crocodiles do. And here's this monkey kind of see him in the jungle. And he, he's like, oh, I'm going to mess with that. And he grabs a big stick and he comes on down the tree and sneaks up behind a crocodile and pops him on the head. Crocodile doesn't move. Monkey's like, hey, that's pretty cool, right? That was fun. <laughs> so, so he does it again. The next day, he sees a crocodile doing the same, same way down the pipe, same thing. Boom. And he does this for about five or six days in a row. Well, finally, on the last day, he comes on down, takes the same approach. He goes, oh, yeah. And he goes to hit him, and a crocodile just turns around. <laughs> and why? Because the monkey, he took the same approach every single day he did the same exact thing time after and he became predictable right and it's the lesson is you can only do the same thing over and over again so many times before it turns around and bites you in the butt and that's right. what happened with the monkey in the crowd and and gym owners sometimes business owners sometimes are very much like that we've been doing it like this for years right i hear that's that a lot. great <laughs> yeah that, that's fantastic is it working for you you know yeah. as a consultant it's like I wouldn't be here if it was working for you. So right. you called me for a reason. Something's broke. Um, and, and that's one of the things. So failure to evolve. It's like when, when you're through changing, you're through. And so we mm -hmm. should always be looking to improve our systems, processes, people, culture, business, uh, you know, marketing, customer service, all those different things. And, and what I call the eight fundamental building blocks of profitability. And so um, I love you it. always have to be, always have to be looking and, and evolving. Yeah. And, and and hey, then I would say I the last one that goes with that is stubbornness. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to change. I make money or I know everything. And, and that was one of the biggest things that I, again, I would, I would talk to these guys. I'm like, well, you sought me out for a reason, but now you're unwilling to make the changes necessary. Right. So, yeah, you know, exactly. Well, what's right. going on here and so yeah. I, I think that that's something that people have to be open to be open to change be open to getting out of your comfort zone and mm -hmm. uh, make sure you have a winning culture yeah absolutely change is only scary if you're not willing to embrace it and just run with it you know <clears throat> it's it, it's so often i hear the same thing that you just talked about you know and i would I, say I wanna... it has to be calculated change too don't yeah. just you know run out there and bet the farm on something like Right. Think about it. You use data to make good decisions, get advice, get counsel, hire a consultant, you know, those types of things so right. that you can make good adjustments, educated, mm -hmm. you know, they, they talk about educated guesses, right? Like a lot of changes are sometimes gambles, yeah. especially when you're a trailblazer or a trendsetter and you're going to do something totally off the wall. Mm -hmm. If it's a calculated risk and there's a reason behind it, go for it. Don't be afraid to give it a try. Yeah, for sure. And speaking of change, uh, Purple Cow. Right. You've talked about that before. <laughs> my favorite, it's my everybody who's ever heard me talk knows I gave that speech about the purple cow. I the love cow. Seth Godin and, his, and that that whole philosophy. Absolutely. Right. Exactly. Can real quickly, can you share what the purple cow is? Because I there's you made a statement that really resonated because we see a lot of it is that there's gyms doing the same thing that are just bigger and smaller in size, but they're yeah. copying each other. And it's- Oh, wow, so you, you watched the video, you watched the- speech. Yeah, yeah, I, I did my homework. <laughs> yeah, nice. So talk that, to me a little bit about the Purple Cow. Yeah, so so first of all, the book is The Purple Cow by Seth Godin. It's been updated several times. He's, he's an amazing marketing genius, great author. He's got a lot of great stuff, um, uh, fantastic uh, to, to read. And if you've never read any of his stuff, please do so. Uh, and no, I don't get anything for saying that, by the way. Um, yeah. I just, again, just a great uh, a believer, so to speak. But, you know, when you think about the principle of the purple cow, it's like, look, if you're driving down some country road, you know, and you see, you know, everybody's just driving, you're going on vacation, you see a field of cows and like, oh, look at the cows, you know, and you're like, oh, there they are. And, and then, you know, mile after mile, it's just another field and another field. And it's like, okay, there's some brown cows and there's some black and white cows. And, you know, you, you, uh, after like the first, second, third field, you're kind of like, eh, it's just cows and you forget they even exist. But what would happen if at one of those farms, there was this big, bright, purple cow standing in the field? Like everybody just slam on the brakes, right? Take out their phone and start taking pictures <laughs> and selfies. Like, yo, check this yeah, out. Yeah, look at this. <laughs> and why would they do that? 
because it was so remarkably different than all the other cows that they had seen. Mm -hmm. It still had, you know, maybe if it's, it's, it still had others and it still had this, and it still had the, the, it was the size of a cow and it still had the same function. Right. And, but it was so different that it made you stop in the world of gyms and health clubs with how many are out there, you mm -hmm. know, clubs are like cows in a sense, like it, they're just bigger, smaller versions of each other offering similar things. And after a while they blend together to the eyes of a consumer. Right. So it's our job to figure out what makes us remarkably different than somebody else. Look, stop saying you're clean. I mean, in COVID it's important <laughs> yeah. to let people know. Thank you. Come on, man. Like, like dude, who wants yeah. to do it? Jim, that's not clean anyway. Why do I have to market that? That's just, right. you just need to be that to put, oh, we have great customer service. Well, would anybody come if you sucked? Like, <laughs> who goes to a restaurant exactly. that says, hey, we have great food. Yeah, dude, I'm there because I hear right. it's got great food. Give me something so good that's so different that makes people stop. Or when they have family or friends, hey, that's my gym. I go there. You got to come check it out. It's got X, Y, and Z. You know, give me something that you can hang your hat on that really stakes your claim in the marketplace and says, yo, here we are. We mm -hmm. do things differently here. And this is what we stake our claim. on. Like, is your customer service so good? You valley park cars and nobody else does. Is your customer service, you mm -hmm. know, a, a real purple cow? Like, or are you just really delivering what people expect a good experience? So there's a lot there. And if you've never read the book, it's fantastic. And um, hmm. If you want to do what Nick did, you can certainly find my my speech on on uh, YouTube or <laughs> on the internet somewhere I, I, for sure. But it's yeah. one of those big things I'm really passionate about. I want gyms that when you come in, you go, "Yo, that's cool. Right. I mm -hmm. need to be here." Absolutely, you hang your hat on it. that's the principles of Purple Cow. Remarkably different than everybody else in the market. Yeah, you know, I, I see so many clubs uh, racing to the bottom, competing on price. And they're saying, well, this person's advertising this and join for this and this a month and this a month. And, then, and pretty soon they're going to be at $1.99 a month. You can't, that's a race to the bottom. And uh, you got to find your purple cow. Well, race to the bottom is, I, you know, see, you can get me all fired up about that. That's a whole different topic for me. Um, you know, there's value in the service that we provide, you know, health clubs and gyms. I mean, we've gotten a bad name for a lot of things. And over this, this last year we have, which is unfounded and ridiculous by all standards. But, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's value, a lot of value in what we do. And we shouldn't cheapen that out. Now, for some people, that's their market, right? There is a there is a, right. a, a place in the marketplace for those low-cost clubs that service a group of people that, that can't mm -hmm. afford a, a better, okay, that's fine. And I'm not saying they should all be done away with. I'm not, I, I don't want to say that. And I would never trash talk somebody like that. But I, I think other clubs that offer full service amenities or do different things, hold that value, you know, because- mm -hmm. We offer something better than than any medicine or pill could do, um, and and we provide a you know mental, physical, sometimes even a spiritual well being that not any anything else can do all in one place. You know, and 100%. I really believe that there's a ton of value to being in a health club and having a membership and having a trainer and engaging and and so I I don't like to to cheapen that product at all. Um, yeah, but again, I'm 100 with you. If you're competing against a low cost, you know, uh, a gym, you know, make sure you know who your target and member is and make sure you know who your target member is not. Mm -hmm. There's there's plenty out there for everybody. If we're all doing our job. Yeah, absolutely. We'll we'll switch subjects here, but you're right. Thank you so much for sharing that, because you got to find the gap in your market and then fill that gap by being the 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 champion of that area whether like you said it's hey we valet park your cars and we're a premium service so we have premium pricing you know whatever that may be but find uh, a niche within your niche right so you can stand and, out and deliver on it don't and just deliver. no yeah. empty words like hey we do this really good and then you're really bad at it like that's right. embarrassing don't <laughs> that's do that terrible. <laughs> yeah for sure yeah. so um you know, I just had Brent Darden on the show from Ursha, and he's, I, I am as well, and I think you are too, very bullish, very optimistic about the next, you know, year or two in the fitness industry. Uh, we got the Gyms Act, which is approaching uh, reality here, which is a $30 billion grant for the fitness industry. Uh, we've got study after study after study by like Credit Suisse and all these major uh, publications that have come out with studies on how the fitness industry is, is really gonna thrive because of all these data, key points, and indicators. 
Um, so I'm very bullish. What are your thoughts on the next couple of years of the fitness industry and, and where do you stand on that and why? I think we're going to see some unbelievable numbers. I mean, 2019 was a great year for the health yeah. club business and the health and fitness industry as a whole. I think if anything, you know, COVID has made a lot of people realize how important health and fitness is, despite the challenges that we face as an industry. Um, and I think people are just so excited right now in the summer to, to get out and, and start to see these mask mandates and things lift and, and in our part of the world anyway. And I know mm -hmm. it's certain starting to come around in others. Other areas are still slower to, to, to come back, but I'm really, really optimistic. I think September, October here in the States and at least this, this part of the world um, could be like a, a January, February for, for most gyms from a membership and PT standpoint. Uh, I do think the industry is going to bounce back stronger than ever. I mean, um, you know, as an industry, as a whole, having one voice, having a stronger voice, getting recognized as being essential and those types of things, getting relief. I think that's one side of the coin from being an owner and operator. Um, you better be ready. You better have your systems and processes in place. Do not cheapen out. Make sure you invest in having the right amount of staff, you know, make sure your technology is up to speed and ready to go don't rest right now because you think things might be slow to develop back. It is going to come. It's going to come fast and heavy in my opinion. And only those who are ready to handle it are going to survive. The last thing you want to do is not be ready for, for that market and, and for it to come back. So um, I'm really optimistic. I'm looking forward to seeing uh, the, the regeneration of, of our clubs and our industry and some great numbers. Um, and I think it's an exciting time to be in the health and fitness industry. And for those who are listening to this that are thinking about opening a gym or considering, it is a great time to invest I agree. Uh, in this business. And so I agree. Uh, great had, challenges bring great opportunity. Right now is a great opportunity. It's not a rock. Yeah, Jared, I, I agree with you so much. I mean, you think about the fact that every market has course corrections every so many years, right? And we just went through one. We went through a purging of where maybe the operators that were over leveraged financially or not the best operators. And there were some great operators that still, you know, were victimized by the situation uh, in their local states or whatnot, but had what, nine, six, nine thousand places close, locations close. And so there was a purging. And so now we're seeing the strongest operators and, and the, 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 it's going to be a, a mad rush. And we're going to see an explosion in this industry, I think. Let's talk about World Gym a little bit. Um, sure. You're the CE, COO uh, at World Gym, and you have a lot on your plate. You're over hundreds of clubs throughout all of the world. Um, talk to me a little bit about how World Gym International is doing as a whole, and then and then what you guys have going on uh, on the franchising side of things in, the, in that world. Well, sure. Um, first of all, I got to say, uh, it, it's great to have some really great operators. Like we, we've got really strong operators in, in countries like Taiwan and Australia that, that definitely make my job easier. I, I can rest a little bit better with some of them and, and, and because of how well that they do uh, mm -hmm. on the whole. But, you know, during the pandemic, obviously my number one concern was making sure that everybody made it through. Uh, right. And I'm happy to report and that out of the 230 plus gyms that we have, we only lost four permanently worldwide. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's not and, good, and, but it's a good percentage. Yeah, yeah, you hate to lose any. Yeah, you don't want to lose Two any. Two of them, sadly, as, as I came in, they were not great operate. They, they were not following systems and processes, franchise guidelines, those types of things. They were not doing well anyway, so they were probably not going to make it. Um, but, you know, the other two, one was a victim. Uh, actually, the other two were, were landlord casualties, uh, uncooperative landlords that we're just not willing to help out and held accountable. So at the end of the day, I mean, that's a pretty good success rate for us. We, we spent a lot of time helping people with comeback strategies, what to do. Um, we, we did some fun things like toilet paper ribbon cuttings in some of the gyms in the United <laughs> States because toilet paper was such a big thing at the time. And, you know, the member had the big scissors and it, it was a great, it was that's a great thing you know, to have some fun with. And, um, so we, we've been very proactive. We've actually been one of the companies playing offense in a world that's been playing defense. We actually ramped up uh, our corporate team to provide more support. We ramped up our marketing team. I, I was able to put together an unbelievable A plus operations team. And, you know, we're aggressively uh, pursuing growth, not just here in North America, but also internationally. And we've got new gyms on the horizon. We've got some big things in the works, things I, I'm not going to talk about here yet, but um, you know, we've done a lot of great partnerships this year. We've improved our vendor network. 
Um, we've tightened the ship. We've provided more support than ever before in the history of the company. We're, we're talking about a brand. We're celebrating our 45th year uh, in business th- this yeah. year. I think a incredible. legacy with, yeah, we didn't, we didn't close shop. We didn't overextend ourselves with corporate gyms or things like that. So we're in a pretty good position to, to play offense right now. And, and um, World Gym is poised to do some great things, both here domestically at home and on the international scale as well. And I'm excited to be a part of it, we're having a great team behind me and working alongside uh, to, to make it happen. And so good, brings good back good memories for me. Because my first uh, first job ever in the fitness industry, I just got out of high school, was at a world gym. There you <laughs> so go. That's awesome. I, I'll never forget it. It was at a yeah. world gym, uh, and that was a blast. And then worked from being at the grunt level all the way to GM of that club for a while, you know. And uh, ah, so I, have, I mean, look, I have an affinity there's for that. so many stories like Nick, there's so yeah. many stories like that. So many people in our industry got their start at a world gym 45 years. I mean, that's nothing to, you know, that that's, yeah. that's something proud. You know, we, everybody got into outdoor workouts, right? Because of COVID, you got to remember, we were one of the, it's in our DNA. It was one of the first things we were known for it was muscle mm-hmm. beach outside in Venice. Yeah, and man. Guys were, <laughs> I mean, we still have gyms with muscle beach as part of our core culture still moving forward is to recreate mm-hmm. that in different spaces. And I mean, we were one of the ones that pioneered this industry. We're still around and we're growing yeah. and we've got a rich legacy, a rich history, mm-hmm. but our eyes are on the future. One of the things we're evolving, we're looking for ways to change, to lead the pack. We don't want to be followers. We want to be leaders. And that's what yeah. we're doing right now. So good things ahead for World Gym. Yeah, that's exciting. And I think World Gym actually landed a diamond with you because you have such a you know, vast experience with being in the trenches in so many different capacities. And you're also very forward and future thinking and um, it, it's going to be successful. It's going to do really well with you, you know, driving that thing. So. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. That yeah. is very humbling. And, and um, I thank you for saying that I'm, I'm up for Absolutely. the challenge and uh, it's been a great ride so far and looking awesome. forward to what we do, but thank you. Yeah, that's it. great. Uh, so to wrap up here, if people want to connect with you either personally or they're interested in anything you have to offer or franchising, what, how do you want them to connect with you? All right. So uh, for, for franchising information or more information about World Gym, please go to worldgymfranchising.com. That's where you can get information. Look, if you're, if you're an independent club owner who's looking at ways to grow, don't be afraid to consider making a move. We have some great opportunities to, to transition to a world gym. And the benefits of that are you get my team and I to help you put in good culture, great systems and processes and help you make money. We want to help you build a better business uh, for you, your future, your employees. So, so look at world gym and our, our legacy for those looking to get into the fitness industry. Uh, please give us a call or take a look worldgymfranchising.com. For me personally, you can find me on all the, the regular social media channels, not TikTok. You're not going to see me making TikTok videos and all the that. Swing kind of dancing, stuff. come on. <laughs> well, you know, there's none of that live on the internet. Some things are just meant for, you know, one and done uh, events. But uh, hey, uh, if anybody out there swing dances and we're at an event, uh, hmm. I'm sure I'm going to live to regret this whole conversation about swing dancing. But uh, for me, Jared, J A R R O D dot Sirocco, S-A-R-A-C-C-O at worldgym.com. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Instagram is at health club doctor. And uh, my Twitter is uh, at Jared Sirocco. So awesome. Yeah. And I can also put some of that in the show, show notes for yeah. you as well. So, all right, cool. Hey, listen, Jared, thank you so much. And remember the more, you know, the more you grow. So like share and subscribe to your success to take your health club or fitness business to the next level. Tune in next time for another great episode of the Fitness Industry Success Show. Until next time.